Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Hey, I, I've done a lot of cool things in my life, like going to Abbey Road and hearing Beatles master tapes. That, that was cool. But a couple of weeks ago, I had one of the most amazing adventures I've ever had. I got to go underground into a limestone mine outside of Pittsburgh. That's one of Iron Mountain's uh, storage facilities. And in this storage facility, way down underground, I got to visit Universal Music Group's tape vault, one of their tape vaults. They've got a bunch of them. But this is one of the biggest ones underground in this limestone mine. And so I have to thank uh, Universal Music Group and Iron Mountain Entertainment Services for letting me visit them underground a couple of weeks ago and now i'm going to take you there because they've given me permission to shoot video there and i think you're going to see some things like you've never seen before and enjoy it's a long video i don't think you're going to want to turn it off because it's it's absolutely amazing so let's go underground to iron mountain outside of pittsburgh and visit universal music group's tape vault okay <laughs> about an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh and we have been allowed here by, uh, by the Iron Mountain people and by uh, Universal Music Group. And we're going to show you how they store their tapes, uh, how they catalog all their tapes, and the entire process that they use to, let's say you want to put a reissue out, how they get the tape and process it so you can put a reissue out, and everything else that there is to know about here. So. Uh, I think we're ready to go. This is going to be great, and it's really exciting to be here and to be able to do this and show it to you. Everywhere you look here, there are tapes. This is, you can see what's here. There's a, a Don Henley, is, these are former Geffen things. There's Don Henley is here. Um, I actually saw some Blue Note things, copies of Blue Note tapes. And uh, this is Don Henley, Man with a Mission. These are obviously multi-tracks. Don and Cooch. It's exciting seeing this stuff. I don't know how you feel about this, but I do. And you know, people like like when I tell stories. So I was with Don Henley when he went the, to the Sunset Grill when the people who owned the Sunset Grill found out that he was Don Henley. But that's all another story that I'll, I'll tell some other time. Oh, look, more tapes are coming. This is it's like, it's, it's like pizza delivery time. Let's see what let's see what we got. It's just showed up. They're still warm. Right here. Oh, the muddy waters. Yeah, let's see what it is. Now, where did these come from just now? came from one of our vaults. We had a list of things that we wanted to pull just as examples of cool things we could see. So oh, great. We had these wow. Before. Exciting. There's an Ella Fitzgerald tape. A bunch of Ella Fitzgerald's tapes. The chain of custody. So the, the tapes so show up here. Order comes into the studio. Talking when to me. Order you. comes into the studio from the vault. It's received by our inbounding team, and the inbounding team uh, accounts for every asset that comes in here, signs off on it. So then it's in the system as received by the studio. So the customer knows at every point where the assets are in the process. Yeah. Let's let's unpack a few of these things, yeah, Michael. Yeah. Sure. Uh, can I take this box? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I don't even know what this is. The Eagle yeah. Street. Oh, that's. Um, Do you know who that is? I don't know who that is. That's volume two, side one, side two. I don't know what that is. But if it's got splicing tape, it's probably a master. Yeah. It says Gems Master. Gem, okay. That's Reverend, Reverend C.L. Franklin. And this doesn't give you enough. Reverend C.L. Franklin. Is this the, oh, this is the one that Aretha's first uh, recording when she's sang with, with her dad. Really? I think that's what this uh, is. 
The Fiery, the fiery Furnace. furnace. That, that's a band also, but this is not that band, obviously. <laughs> I love these old. Oh, well, yeah, audio tape, sure. This is. Uh, let's see what's on the back. Chuck, Chuck Berry. Berry. Mono Master. School days. Oh, really in rock? Well, how cool is that? When did the police do the police that? Ride at Atlanta. Maybe a. Wow. Is that 99 or 89? I can't read. Or 97? It would be funny if you pull out the uh, the police at uh, Agora tape that, that, I, that I returned to you guys. <laughs> that would be kind of funny. He telling me that he, he had a tape that someone at A&M loaned him, the police live in, in Agora. And then he returned it. And I said, well, I hope it made its way back. Because I'm an honest guy. Oh, Louis Armstrong. This is a copy. Yeah, it says copy. And it looks yeah. like a copy. Yeah, well, I mean, at least the box does. Yeah. The tape. No splices, so... He has relatively new tape. Nice to have a copy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another Chuck, Chuck Berry, Berry Twist LP Mono Master. School days. Sweet little 16. So this is similar stuff was on the other tape, too. Two of two. It says two of two, record two. But, so you have to go through and you have to figure out what all this stuff is on, on top oh, yeah. of it because it could I mean, be that's what, our, that, that's what our label guys do so yeah. like, when they research a project yep. they'll look at this and figure out what's what Bing, B -b 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 -bing Crosby when I was trying to respond Lura 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 yeah MG so that was a that was a, a verve it's MG. really nice handwriting yeah. wow The way these tapes are, the way they're, the writing is like, it, it wasn't considered anything just important, just mixed on Scully yeah, I mean, three tracks. Could be better. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, these were work yeah. products, you know, they were, they weren't like revered. Yeah, let's pull over, let's pull, let's see, let's see relics, what that looks like. Know? Oh. And there are notes. And there are lots of splices in that, so. Yeah. Oh. Rock by Rock. Remixed and edited together to form complete session. True Love Ways. So this must have been the New York s sessions with with orchestra. And Norman Peggy Petty. Sue married Norman Petty. Wow, this is just just seeing this gives me the chills. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Here's something from 1961. This is just like a label copy sheet. Yep. And there's Baby, won't you come out tonight? Both definitely an assembled master. Look at all the different. Yeah. Uh, the different. Of uh, course, different tape. colored tape. Yeah. Uh, Pithy and, Te and Temple Studio. Well, he recorded a lot. Mono original, stereo on the other reels, because there was both mono and stereo. And this is important. Acetate, do not bake an acetate. Right, you only want to bake the mylar, the yeah. bad mylar things. Yes. 1958, 30 Ips originals. At New York City, yeah, yep. Yeah. This is when he came to New York and, he was, and yeah. he had an orchestra. And then this is from, oh, 2018. This is a, a preservation, some preservation notes. Yeah. Source and leaders. Spices and leaders. Cleaned, cleaned and replaced. And replaced. Yeah. yeah. Tape location card. From Obviously, there's no no uh, splices on that one, so it's... so it's. Um, yeah, you, you oh, can't this. see them. Oh, yeah. This tape is not packed beautifully. Uh, it's, oh, know, yeah. it's a little uneven, so you can't really see yeah. the... Yeah, they are the leader, but yep. it's in okay. there. The Norman Petty tape. Clovis, New Mexico. <laughs> the Stephen M. Hoffman. Uh huh. That's, That's cool. That is cool. Wow. Look how good his handwriting was. And that was so. What? That's that's that's. So a, this was a tape box. A small, the seven-inch reel. Well, 
Uh, no, this was cut. This was cut out of the tape. Box oh, wait, that's right. Point. Yeah. It just preserved because it was. Yeah. Look, songs by Buddy Holly, original tapes Buddy made in apartment in New York. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. It's homebrew time, and there and the, and there's spices in that tape for sure. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they put it just, like, just on a nicer reel. Nicer reel, yeah, exactly. Oh, that means it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Danny Kay, it looks like. DK. On Dot Records. Yeah. Mm. My first humiliation, humiliation in life came from Danny Kay. Oh? Yeah, we were at the Palace Theater seeing a Danny Kay show when I was a kid. And he asked a date for something. When, anybody in the audience know the date for a certain thing? And my father whispered the date to me, so I yelled it out. And he said, that's wrong, girly. Right away. Oh, oh no idea. crushing. Oh, you don't want to know. And you remember it. Oh, how do you forget something like right, that? That's right. Ella. MCA Recording Studios. Okay, so this was originally done in 75 in New York. Transfer 15 years. Transfer from. Yeah, this okay. is... Because if it's MG, it's probably earlier than seventy-five. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. This was a cop. This was yeah. transferred in seventy-five. Yeah. But look, it's it, what that reel looks older than seventy-five. Yeah, and also those are all the spices are in there, so they, did, they didn't just transfer reels. So you have to determine whether that's the correct box, whether that's the correct. Oh yeah, yeah it's a lot of work yeah. to yeah. get that done. Yeah. yeah. Time to. Yeah, and they ran this at thirty ips, which is great. Yeah. But that's not what the original would have been. So. The impressions. Oh, wow! We're a winner. 1968. You've been cheating. I've been. People get ready, right there. People get ready by the impressions on this tape. That's yeah, like that was that. This is it. This is the tape. Yep. That's. Ooh. Oh, so it's just it's just a pancake. You need to get some flanges on this thing. Yeah, just a just a pancake. Billy Holiday and Louis Armstrong, Bob Hope and Shirley Ross. So, so we don't even know what this really is. No. Unissued alternate oh. needs left and right. Use well, the problem, of course, is that if somebody did release it after this was written, they wouldn't have come back and scratched it. That's right. That's, that's so. At some point, it was unissued. <laughs> All of this was unissued yeah, at some right, point. Yeah. What does that even mean? I don't know. You'd have to listen to it. <laughs> you play the tape and, it's, and it runs out. And it's or maybe maybe it means they are not supposed to be joined? I don't know. So cool. Sure. And you know, at some point, Bob, <laughs> I always complain about this. You know. Putting the sticker on there? Yeah, there was a time when... They, when it's a huge again, challenge. You don't want to ever obscure metadata. And even though this doesn't seem like metadata, maybe... 30, 40, 50 years ago, but now that's metadata. Yeah, it's the well, brand yeah. of the tape yeah, exactly. is part of the archive uh, management. So knowing what brand, when it was manufactured, might reveal whether it needs to be prioritized as an at-risk format yeah, for right. preservation or something that... Um, and also it's a cool visual well, it's a sure. artifact. Yeah. You know? Now, can I mean, you get that off of there? You don't want to get yeah, it. Yeah, we have, we have way. I mean, we've talked about this with Iron Mountain. What's on the back side of there? Let's see what this is. Billy Holiday. Oh. Uh, Strange Fruit. 1958. The other tracks are removed. To a, probably to a comp reel. Yeah. yeah. Fine and mellow. Original yes, not for mastering. Too much echo? Question mark. <laughs> it's for you Question. to determine. This is yeah. Commodore. Do you system. think this has too much echo? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Commodore. So this, is, this is old. Now, what's in this box? Is so there's not going to be a whole lot, lot left on the one song? Or two. But that's the original. Yeah. Oh. So you can see a lot of the tapes been removed. Yeah. That means yeah. out to master pad. I don't want it to step on your Yeah. Wow. So that means the tape was spun off and compiled. Sure. Or someplace else. Video. But the original of this track, which is so critical to her discography is still here. This is it. Yeah, that is it. 
table with a deck of stickers. Isn't that yeah. great? And it says Made in Great Britain. But, but in Hayes, where we actually had an archive facility until two years ago. Yeah. In Hayes. I, I visited there. We also at and the All Stars. Satchmo at Pasadena. Uh, cool. EMI tape Middlesex. Now, how, I wonder if it's just on that. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that would be EMI. What year is this on Pat? Uh, so, is this, this is an EMI flange with a, what's, what is the, the, re, the re, receiving, uh, the receiving hub? Hub. Uh, I'll get one for you. Ah, you got one. I know it's not Atlanta, Georgia. That's a receiving hub, but different kind of. <laughs> Oh, it's Reverend Franklin. Reverend Franklin. The Bill Grower production. Rev Franklin, they were on a first name basis. So this recopied, limited and EQ'd in 1964. 64. Yeah. yeah. Check out this. That's what this is. Look how quickly he came up with that in two yeah. seconds. How often do you see that? Um, every day. I don't know about every day, but we do see them more than you would think that we would. Yeah. That's, um, that's, you know, basically, the platter sits on there like that, and then this, it, it doesn't work without the post of the tape yeah, machine, yep. but because this screws down, there's a screw in here, and it screws down into the, the yeah, very secure system, the pin, the pin of the, of the, of the, the, the play yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and so then it, it, it yeah, it's grooved here, so it basically locks it right on there. Yeah. So, oh, I see it. Yeah. yeah. So cool. It can't, it can't spin that way or that way, and it can't lift up. Yeah, lift up is the big problem with these things. So this is the inner sanctum, and the tapes just keep rolling in here. Is this, is this like a? Some place you'd like to visit like this? I know, I know, I would. Well, they've got some some vintage video over here. Look, a U-matic. I think they're set up pretty well in here. Sony Betamax, that's my format of choice. What going on in here? This would be a good job to have, don't you think? A belly button, I've got that on vinyl. This, this, you know, what this looks like this looks like something that was done with with artificial intelligence or. or, or you know, I see the door at the very back end. There's like a green door back yes. there. When you walk through that, all this happens again. It's another room this size. Oh. <laughs> it's stunning. That's huge. Richard Thompson. And right next to it is a record by the Carpenters. And right next to it is a record by Luther Vandross. And there's Malabra sound report. So, so the, we'll run out of film doing the for ocean, ocean way, electric lady in here. Well, and this this part of what I really love about looking at tape spines is all the cool, you know, um, yeah, sound uh, factory uh, logos. Oh, the wow. Jesus Lizard, Eddie Kramer, Lisa Marie Presley. Look at that. Wow. 
So much history in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Well, the Westerberg. And Chicken Grease, D'Angelo. Oh, yeah, wow. The Dandy Warhols. Yeah. Ben Hart. Ben Hart. It's like there's no. You know how Ben Hart. Monty Scott's, I was just there last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Second show, second night of who? It doesn't say. Yeah, Someplace it says. And they were recording multi track tape. Sarah Vaughn. Oh. <laughs> second night, second show. Okay. Yeah, here's the thing. If, if you look after the Beatles archive, you know that every single thing in that archive is incredibly valuable. And yes. Important. You look after the Stones archive, same thing. You look yeah. after any artist collection, it's everything is critical. Yeah. We're a different animal. Yeah. We have copies of copies. We have boxes full of staplers and other things that have been collected from people's offices. Right? So we end up with six million assets across the world, and the job is to constantly figure out what the most important stuff is. We don't throw anything away, right. but we do have to prioritize. Sure, it. otherwise yeah. it's... So it's... And you're a, constantly discovering things. Constantly. That's, constantly. that's the I'm most of it. And people say, well, why didn't you just use the original tape the first time? Well... <laughs> Yeah, maybe we didn't find it right. in time. Maybe it was mislabeled. Yeah, I exactly. Oh, right. okay. When the label actively pulls orders, right? Let's say they're looking for Sarah Vaughn. They keyword search in their existing database for Sarah Vaughn, and they get a ton of hits. But it's hard for them without precise, comprehensive metadata to actually nail exactly what they're looking for. Yeah. So it necessitates you guys pull everything you have. That's right that delays the process of digitizing oh. what they need. And then our engineers are their eyes and ears saying, hey, is this it, is this it? This is probably it, this isn't it, whatever. So they're pulling these assets, then they have a subset that they then digitize, and then the label you know, pushes them. But also, just the metadata isn't enough. There's so much contextual information that you can glean from the actual tape. Box. Right, sure. It helps when you're researching what sources you want to use for a particular project, right? Yeah. yeah like, Today, when we're looking at those tapes, much more meaningful than just to look at a bunch of information. Of course. On if how of course. if something's circled, how do you put that on a spreadsheet? If something's highlighted, right. put that in, or an acronym says OTM, out to master. Right. When you have a data entry person going in there, they're expected to somehow put that into some searchable index field. So holding them, as you said, that's the best way to do it. So. It was inspired by our, our uh, collaboration to revitalize this vault was this, to bring the metadata gathering part into here. And the way it works is metadata is collected off of the boxes. So when asset arrives, there are touch screens, stations on both sides. So you simply lay the asset on the glass and touch the screen and it moves forward. And we're not logged in or started yeah, yeah. yet, so. And then what this does is it captures all six box side. Oh. And it That's photographs Aerosmith. them. That's Aerosmith. Oh, handy, right? right? There, Aerosmith. Yeah. And um, all the metadata is captured. It's OCR'd, so optical. Uh, character recognition, right. so it converts this into searchable text. Every barcode is scanned, and in some instances, there are barcodes from previous vaults, so maybe a previous owner, uh, and this was uh, acquired by Universal Music, sure. so that comes in. Our barcodes, the customer ID barcodes are all registered. In the box dimensions are picked up by a laser, so you can actually search by the dimensions of the box. That's important if you're looking for a two-inch reel. Sure and you place your order and a bunch of half inch reels pop up, you can take those out of your order wow. placement because you know, or vice versa, if you're looking at specifically ordering two inch reels of a certain make or brand, all this is also gathered. Like yeah. who's gonna pay data entry people to collect this? This is all collected OCR and searchable. And now you could be sitting in your apartment in New York and you can look at these tape boxes wow. as and though you're holding do your research. Wow. Level. That's fair. That's very helpful, obviously. Oh, yeah. So, Bob, I think the first one has been a year. Yeah. This is this one's brand new. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is a brand new second one. So the first one, we did a pilot with them, and that was a very successful 200,000 asset processing. 
to help them inbound newly acquired assets. Um, as Pat mentioned, there's a lot of stuff that's unidentified. Like they, they're, they're always uh, looking to preserve everything. So sure. that means sometimes an A&R person leaves, their office is cleared out and there's media in there, but there's also staplers and envelopes yeah. and office supplies. That all ends up here. And <laughs> it's through this process of identifying what's in there and adding it to the inventory and removing the low value stuff. And what we used to do is, you know, before we had this technology, we would put this tape box on a flatbed scanner. Scan this side, scan that side, scan. Oh. And then these guys came up with a cool iPad photographing uh, uh, procedure system, right? system yeah. which worked nicely. And, you know, that was okay, but then you end up with a PDF with a whole bunch of pages, and it's big and bulky. This is revolutionary. Now, this is adapted from, it was originally designed for some other use than specifically. No, this was something we literally de developed working with Nick and Pat oh. and the archive team for yeah. UMG. And, and the, the, the company that makes this, though, I mean, they... It's a private uh, yeah. developer and that they, we work with. I see. So this is, you literally order this machine to be developed for you. We gave them a list of what we need done with media assets, wow. giving them dimensions, went under NDA and contract with yeah, them, and yeah. they're, they're a global sort of 3D solution sort of development company wow. that we work with, and they partnered with us to build this thing, but no other one of these, other than the first one we made, exists. And this is the second one? This is the second one, just to keep up with the archive. But to put it into some perspective, and Nick, I think you have these numbers, um, the old way, the manual way, scanning every box site and all that, was taking uh, about four to six minutes per asset, obviously depending on how much is written and sure, how much metadata sure. needed to be collected manually. So it was... Uh, 1,500 assets was sort of the threshold that we would hit each month with one individual collecting metadata. So two people, obviously, 3,000 assets. In a year, you could get through 36,000. So how many, years, how six, many years would it take to do everything six here? Six million physical assets globally for UMG. Oh. Yeah, so do the math. We, we would long be in the ground. Yes. <laughs> um, with this, we can uh, fully staffed, one person on either side working per shift, we can hit up to 24, 2,500 wow. assets wow. per shift. Wow. So having a couple of these things running three shifts, we could saw through a large part of this archive very quickly. And do you, are you going to run three shifts of this, or do you run three shifts? UMG it? drives the processing, so they're going through their archive determining what's next, what assets they want to identify. Do they want to go by format? Do they want to go by artist? Do they want to go row by row? That's, right. that's and then their call. Also, obviously, Michael, there's a, there's a difference in the type of asset, right? Like, it's a videotape? Yeah, yeah, this is a little less interesting to get a full scan of than that tape, that two-inch tape from right. Ronnie Scott's, for instance. Is that because this doesn't tell you anything? Yeah, it doesn't really open? tell you much. There's not a whole lot of contextual information here. Yeah. As long as you get the whatever data is on here, then you've pretty much, you've got what you need, you know. Um, Just a comparison on how many assets we do before, right? So like, say this Aerosmith thing, right? Would have been five months of just the imaging alone on that. Uh, it was done in two days. Michael, we're actually gonna do a live demo of this thing, and then show you the results. And then, uh, okay. All right, so we got everything set. I'm gonna go in our scanning mode. I'm going to put our asset as centered on the glass flatten as I can, and then just hit scan. You hear the shutters go, and then you can take it off, and put it on the part. So the view we have here is our raw, uncropped view. Right. And then once it gets processed, it'll show up on the, the actual process. Well, and this is Aerosmith. Yeah. Yeah, all Aerosmith. Let's just do these three. So you oh, that's see it's, fast. It's yep. picking up the dimensions of the asset down here on the bottom. Yep. We're tracking how many scans we did today, each session. And as it gets processed, it'll show up on the screen here. 
Okay, so let's show them. Uh, so we're showing, we just scanned three assets. Yep. So you could see, uh, Pat was talking about this before, there's a consolidated PDF that always does the same order for research purposes. Right. Front of the box, back of the box, primary spine, secondary spine, top and bottom. Always in that order. So they can go through a lot of PDFs and research okay. quickly. All these images are then cropped. So you can see the cropping comes in yep. uh, to just to give it a more cleaner look. And. Um, box dimensions are all captured. You can see those on the bottom. Yeah, wow. You can tell what half inch reels or two inch reels are. And some 3D. Yeah. As Pat was saying, you could be in your apartment in New York and it virtualizes this ball. So you could then... So I'm going to export the data that we captured. Okay. <laughs> Loaded question. Yes. Yeah. So, that goes into our exports folder. Here's the one for them today. I'll look at the CSV real quick, but here's all the data that we captured, the dimensions, all the barcodes. Okay, how is this stored? On a hard disk? Yeah, so there's a... And you have to make a copy of the hard disk for backup. And then you have to store it someplace it else. It pipes it up into the web and it puts it into a UI that becomes more user friendly, I obviously, see. for that for Universal to research this stuff. All this metadata exports directly into their database. So now they have more comprehensive data. If some of the metadata already exists for these assets, it appends it with this new, oh, wow. more accurate data. Wow. And it adds these pictures to that archive for that asset. So here's one of our assets here. I'm going to open up our 3D view. And nice. This is very nice. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So now if you're sitting in your apartment in New York yeah, you and you want to hold the asset and you want to see what it looks like. Pat, did you see this? Come here. Man. You're missing all the good stuff. <laughs> So we just yes, this easy. is what I'm talking about. Yes. This, this is what makes research exciting. Yes. He, he, he told this. me that you're going to add smell to this next. Is that true? Yes. And there's a scratch I mean, the screen, actually, right now. You joke, but just like books, That's tapes good. have a... Yeah. yeah. That is... Yeah. Yeah. I love the smell That's of tapes. Incredible. And you can always tell what kind of tape it is totally. or where it was stored. Especially. Which is what we always, people laugh with. We always do a little sniff test. Of course. That is, that's unbelievable. So that all goes up into the UI and yeah. then uh, from there Universal can dictate where they want it. If they want to push it into backup servers, if they want to, they, they control the disposition from there as well. So they can say these assets low value, send them to another storage. These assets are product. We want to keep product in a separate archive. Yeah. These assets need to go to the studio immediately for, for our request. These assets need to be preserved because they're at risk. And the other stuff, they just co you know collect the metadata. So I think when they named the company Universal, they're finally really living up to their name at this point. Yes, <laughs> it's really go. unbelievable. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And so, and so the value of these is actually, like the long-term value is questionable because <laughs> this tape is terrible. I know. But digital, this digital tape's horrible. I know. And once you've extracted the ones and zeros from this, you've what got do you, the ones and right, zeros. So what do you need? It's not like one. an analog transfer right. that could be done, you know, with a variety of, of quality results. Right. But still, you're going to keep all. You have to keep all. So now, yeah, for now. At some point. I mean, good. I kind of try to... And I, I, I'm an archivist, so I can't throw anything away. Yeah, <laughs> I get, maybe I, I can it. find some other place to put them that's maybe, I don't know, a, a deeper, darker hole? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Another hole in the mountain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, we'll figure that out. Are we going to walk down this hole? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. This is where it gets fun. Betamax. Some of this stuff is triple stacked. You know? Shania Twain, triple stack. Okay. Oh, this is just. Film. So, film, as you can see, is stored flat. Right. Yeah. right. Whereas the analog tape is stored uh, vertically.
Sandra Wilson. Everywhere you look, this this everywhere you look, there's someplace you want to stop and look. Oh yeah. <laughs> Alumba recordings. I never heard of that place. Me neither. Alumba. Used to be a lumber yard. <laughs> Oh, look at this. Oh, Neil Records. Bogart. This. <laughs> Produced by Neil Bogart. Here's an M&M. Rick Ocasek. It's a Weezer record. Produced by Rick. <laughs> Engineered by Tom Lord Algae. And we're just coming upon this stuff. This wasn't like put out here for my benefit. I, I promise you. <laughs> they didn't just, let's make the end caps really, really cool, really like at a supermarket. Yeah, exactly. Guns and Roses. Upstock the end caps. Yeah. Curly Shuffle. I don't think that ever came out. Mm -hmm. I don't even know. Oh, that, 1999. So. so this is during that Chinese democracy era. So I don't know that record. I don't think Curly Shuffle. Were they talking about Curly Mo and <laughs> and Shemp? That's right. I try thinking, but nothing happens. <laughs> Oh, Bruce Sugar was the engineer on this. I know that man. Isn't he a songwriter? The problem is, how do you, you how do you work? Because you come here, you stop, and you have to look at all this stuff. What is this? Mrs. Robinson. This is like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where, yeah. where, where they just put it in, in that big thing and closed the vault, and then it wasn't seen again. It's not alphabetized. They know where everything is. The Neville Brothers. So how much? How much of this is no? Is this has all been cataloged and known? This is all cataloged. All cataloged. Oh, yeah. So in, in two minutes you could you could pick anything that's here. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you told me that black door down there. The lights go on. It's another of this. Can we just walk down there and just, just you can keep going? <laughs> I don't think people believe. They don't believe it. Well, hey, Michael. You mentioned uh, Gillian Wells. Yeah. Woodland Studios. Oh. There you go. E.D. Brickell and the New Bohemians, a Bearsville Studios, an analog safety of a digital master. An analog safety of a digital master. That's interesting. <laughs> Robbie Robertson. <laughs> the vibe mix. <laughs> this is just... Look, it, it's almost to the ceiling. Uh, check this out again. This is a Warner format, and the red stripe meant it was a cassette master. Huh. So you know, you know all that configuration. Yeah. It's good to know all yeah, that. Yeah. It's good to have been around. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Sterling sound. All right, now let's let's walk down the, to the end here. Criteria. There you go. Gateway Mastering. Look Criteria Studios, on. 72. Greg Allman. Okay. It's just... So you go through here and you see a lot of things that's like, well, who cares? Who needs them? They're here just because they have to be here. And then you come up on things that are like, right. wow. Because the who? Wow. Glenn Johns. Glenn Johns. I Island The who? Yeah. Oh, wow. Anza Studios. That's where the Stones did uh, that 1975 record. I interviewed Glenn Johns. That was an interesting interview. Oh, really? I bet. He was surly. Was he? Yeah, the, the, the more nice things they said about him, the, the more surly he got. But it was fun. I, I... Pat, didn't you read a book by him? Did he write a yes, book? Yes, he did. 
he, and he, he was actually when I was at Abbey Road last week. They said that he'd been there the week before. Oh, okay. Recording some orchestral thing. Oh, wow. It was Waylon Jennings. That's all it says. Waylon. Same handwriting exactly, as, the, as producers. the producers. Exactly. I recognize I that. I wonder what that means. Uh, the wallflowers. Yeah, who knows what that means. <laughs> the forensics team on it. That's what we do. Yeah, that's right. It's probably somebody at the label. That's the same. Bobby Brown. That's the same handwriting. T same guy, too. Interesting. Yeah, new edition. New edition yeah, yeah right, so that uh, must have been... New edition was Motown, right? Yeah. We got Boingo, 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 but Bobby Brown. But yeah, you're right. Boingo, Boingo's got the same. Interesting. Not for production. Yeah. Sterling Sound. Stone Roses. And sometimes they have these notes on here saying not for production, but they don't tell you why it's yeah, not for production. Exactly. Don't yeah. use, and then there was always uh, do not use, right. and that was actually the one you want to use. Right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. But to your point, if that file that I made last week, you know, if that ends up in somebody's hands 30 years from now, it's just called DNU. They have yeah. no, no idea why. Yep. You know? What percentage of what's here is, is video and what percentage of it is audio, do you know? I'm going to guess 80-20. 80-20, 80, 20. 80, 20, 80, 80 uh, audio. And then, of course, here is, you know, the, the 2000s, hard drives. So what we've done, because hard drives, especially the earlier hard drives that were not uh, solid state, that were... Um, right. Um, you know, they had bearings. A spinning they had disc, spinning right, disc. yeah, of course. So... Those things, after a year, they don't really spin up anymore. Yeah, yeah. So what we've done is we've made disk images of all the hard drives so that we can at least open them as hard drives and then figure out what to do with them after right. that. But we still keep the uh, we still keep the drives. We just can't yep. can't bring ourselves to throw it away. So these are mixes. Yeah, Laura and Navarro. They were good. I remember them. Yeah, yeah me too. Are they still around? So if you, if you ever open a box and there's nothing in it, you just then throw it away, or if it's if it's empty, yeah, or, or if yeah, then we would throw yeah, it away. Adam Duritz was convinced. Yeah, he was convinced it was, it was missing forever. Gone. And you uh, found it. It was. I have to look it up. Specifically, the title. I don't remember the title off the top of my head, but it was of recent, and he was out of his mind. Like this, he, he was, was so elated because he was convinced it was gone. Yeah, so, all these years. You know, that's what our team is. I joke around. We have our forensics team. Yeah, but I mean, they'll take how they found the tape was. By its, it was the wrong label, wrong artist, wrong everything, but there was a, a lyric, and one of our guys were able to just determine from the lyric, hey, maybe it's that. And it's a lot of views on the internet, a lot uh, of digging in, and we, we joke around. We say we're forensics, but that's how they... That it is. So sometimes when I just think it's lost, they keep going. And so when, every day could bring you an exciting thing. Oh, that's what's so cool. when you find something, especially when uh, it makes an artist happy yeah. like that, yeah. oh, man, there's yeah. nothing Robbie, like it. Uh, um, I, I know, you know. Can I throw yeah. another one in there? Yeah. This is a great yeah. one that came out. Um, so when I was at... Universal. We were looking for the Guitar Hero stuff, and one of the the titles that just kept popping up as a request but never came out. And they wanted to digitize it and stem it for video games. Was Kiss, Rock and Roll All Night. We all know it. That hum a few bars. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we found a million versions of it. We never found the version of it, which was, I guess, the history of it. If you're a fan, was that it was totally live, but was it really live? And we went, scoured all the Kiss tapes, all everything that was out there, couldn't find it. Reached out to the band, reached out to production, record labels, never found it. Flash forward, Guitar Hero's gone, and, and we're just going through these archives looking at tapes. And a bunch of Kiss assets came in for a totally unrelated request. And one of the tapes was like a dummy reel from the studio where they were just running like uh, reverbs and stuff into, they were doing guitar solos on it. And it very clearly on the front said, D-N-U. Right? Of course. Yeah. Do yeah. not use it. Of course. Yeah. So Brett Zinn the guy spins you it up in the studio earlier. Just, just to see what was on the reel. And, um, and he spins it up and it is head to tail, all the multi-track elements for rock and roll all night. The version that made the record like cryptically hidden in this. Whoa! Thing. Okay, so just keep going. Just keep walking. Remember that. I think the lights. If you walk in, I think oh, they're on. Wait, 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 wait. wait, we've discovered something. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't Kiss Assets be a great name for a record? Transco Lacquer. Look at that. Unknown by unknown. I know that group. <laughs> I went to Transco in 1986. 
1987 to see how they make lacquers. Oh, but, yeah? but I couldn't film it because I didn't have a video camera in 1987, oh, but I have cool. some pictures of it. Yeah. And nobody cared about that but me and six other people in the world. And now we all Why care about it. Why do we have two holes? Two holes. Yeah, there are two why? holes in lacquer. For some reason, there are two holes in, in a lot of those things. I forget why. But cool. And we don't know what that is. And guess what? This is it. <laughs> oh, that's helpful. It's, it's unknown by unknown, but this but is, is it. it. Yeah. Okay, we're going to walk into the valley of the shadow of even more assets. Okay, the lights are supposed to come on. <laughs> they lied to me. Now they got me trapped. Oh, here we go. It took a little bit. Oh, my God. It's a little colder in here. Yeah, and look, and there were tapes up there, and there are tapes over Dottie here. West. I don't know Dottie West. Is she a country singer? I think so, yeah. I would hope America so. America over here? Cat Robbie Marcus. Neville. Al you walked by Al Oh, uh, wait. Uh, I just did walk by Al I, 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 I literally walked by him at the... Uh, Friday night in San Francisco. No, I nope. the roadway at the show there. in... Uh, in Munich, he was the guest of honor. He was. Wendy Waldman. El Demio. Okay, but this this kind of nitpicking, we could be here all day just looking at these end caps. Yeah. It's just, it's... Mm. Director's reels. I don't know if anybody will ever look at these ever again. Well, what's at the end of the I don't even know what movie they're for. But those are like dailies, I would imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More Ocean Way. Jordan Air. House of Shock. Yeah. Scotch 111. Indestructible. Indestructible. Yeah. That was the best tape. Jordan Air's. Brahms violin. Look at that handwriting. Beautiful. Of Nathan Milstein. Brahms violin concerto in D major. <laughs> Look at what's, what's left on this ring. Wow. A bunch of stuff cut out to the production master. Does, does it say what that is? That's the Jordanaires. Yeah. Just the backup singer, so that's all you need. <laughs> that's right. Some of it, some of it, some of it, I think the... It's just, it's just endless tapes, 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 tapes. And there are tapes you can trust. Yes. Jimmy Shigeda. Bones, that would have been Bones Howe. Yeah, Bones Howe, great, one of the great engineers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mercury Sound Studios. Oh. Oh, feeling buddy rich. Oh. There was so much stuff recorded. That's the other thing you realize, how much stuff was recorded. Yeah, actually recorded, yeah. Larrabee, we have EMI UK, we have Chris, Chris Kimsey. I'm just going to walk to the end and back. Just... Jeez. Mind-boggling. It's, it's mind-boggling. That's the only word for it. Carry on and the Philharmonia, it's EMI England, so an angel, an angel record. All of these were released on angel records, and, and most of them are terrible. Oh, really? Not the recordings, the recordings are fantastic, but the angel, the, just the pressings, they could not press a good, a good classical record in America. It was very, very difficult. Well, Capital couldn't, they just couldn't. See, like, just like I said, well, next to the OJs. Yeah, Look, see, say, yeah. we're, we're back here where the classical stuff is. It's Walter Gieseking, who was a, a great pianist. And uh, next to it is the OJs. The OJs, yeah. And they, they're getting yeah. together and making a record. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> so w when things are organized, they, they change how they're organized, right? They, in other words, they would, if they took all this stuff out and scanned it, they wouldn't put it back here. No. It would then be... Or a new, just a new location. Yeah, and there's some... You, so you have zones where things go, I assume. They can talk, they can talk in more detail about how it works, but... Toots Maytel. So, toots, so, so how much of this has been... in Milton Nascimento, this is great. This is a good shelf right here. Yeah. How much of this has been or, scanned and organized, or is all of this unordered? It's all organized. It is all organized. This is all cataloged. 
Okay. Yeah. So why are the OJs next to Walter Gieseking? Just because... It doesn't make sense to me. Well, but the way, we're, we're storing things by format, not by... I got, okay, I got you. Not by the music. I, no. I got you. See, that's... These are, where, where it's all together is in the database. So if you look at the OJs, you see... 100,000 different OJs right. things, but they're all over the place. Right, and you wouldn't see uh, Walt Geezy King and, and the OJs together. No. no. You wouldn't. Look, there's a record by the Beach Balls. Not the Beach Boys, the Beach Balls. It's just unbelievable. Look at all this tape. Wanda Jackson. The, the um the thing you want to do is just pull it out and see what it is. Yeah, do it. <laughs> you do it. I don't, want to, I, don't want, I don't want to mess anything up. You know, the thing for me is what is it? 1970. Wanda Jackson, capital it. Mono. Huh. Off off. What does that mean? Don't know. We don't know. I actually walked through here one time and I pulled a tape that I knew was from Warner and it was a tape that I had made of a John Fogarty project in 1997. How cool is so, that? It's so cool to have the stuff that I've touched in here. Yeah. And, you know, people who do this today for a living, there is no physical asset. Yeah. It's kind of sad. Yeah. You know, somebody put their heart and soul into making this in 50 years ago. Yep. And here it is. Have it. I love it. I love the whole thing. Me too. And what I love is that uh, a generation of young people gets that, gets the physical thing, the yeah. having the physical thing. Yeah, they that's get right. it. That's right. And that's just fantastic. And when I bring them into our, you know, young kids into our studio where we cut lacquers and explain to them what that process is, their minds are blown. Yeah. And then what I usually tell them is, this was revolutionary at one point because before you could do this, people had to sing all day long, over and over again, into ten gramophones that were recording right, wax that's right. cylinders. That's right. And if you had a hit of, the, you know, if you had a, if you sold ten thousand copies, that meant you sang the thing like five thousand times. Yeah. Uh oh. What have you found? Jay Giles freeze frame. Look at that. Spearded hot one. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm friends with Peter Wolf. Oh, wait, Good hot, hot one. one. Okay, wait, Good. Wait Good mix to refer to. Let's see, 1982, August 19. I saw them on that tour. That's oh, capital. We found a good row here. Thomas, Thomas Dolby. He's, yeah, Thomas Dolby. There's more Jay Giles. A ton of Jay Giles here. Sammy Hager. Harry Nelson. McGuinn Clark Hellman. Piss on the wall. Ashford Jay Giles. Simpson. Did that come out, that song? Piss on the Wall? Yeah. Piss on the Wall by Jay Girls. Look at it, it's very, very good. Very, very good. <laughs> this is Billy Squire. Yep. Where are we looking? I missed it. This is, this is like the Boston. This is all, the, they, they have this right, right, separated right. By, <laughs> by region. So all the, every group's from Boston are here for some reason. Or something. something. Oh, more Jay Girls. Let's see what we got here. Uh, Angel and Blue. This is one of the no, So all the, all the Giles assets yeah. are... Okay. Uh, this is what I did when I came here last time. I just literally just wandered around for a while <laughs> by myself. And I was like, oh, look at that. I took pictures. Uh, more, more J. Giles. There's all this J. Giles stuff here. Yeah, really? We're in this section. section. Superfly. There's Superfly 1990 from Bernie. <laughs> Oh, it's got Lenny Kravitz remix, hip hop remix. Okay. So, Andre Fred, this is a classical. The Berlioz Requiem, that's yep. dance music. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, that was the back room. This is the front room. It is. It's like 10 degrees warmer through that door. Interesting. Just going to walk all the way through here. Without stopping, just so you can, just so you can experience this, because it's just absolutely. We walk all the way to the front door. We could stop any place, and 
find a tape. And what is this? This is Adios Marakita Linda. I have no idea who that is. It doesn't matter. Meat, then you get to look down a little bit. Meat Loaf. Look down a little bit. Elton John. Richard Perry. I'm ready. Right there. So wherever you look, there's just... It's... And it is organized. It, it's, it seems like it's disorganized because you'll, you know, because there was, you know, the OJs next to, uh, to uh, Giza King. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be good if they did a mashup of Walter Giza King and, and the OJs? Like, like, let's see what's here. Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells in the orange tape. Patty LaBelle. Shadow facts. Okay, now we're in the New Age section. Hey, man, I'm feeling mellow. Um... MCA Bobby Brown, that, that, and that's in metal boxes. Crazy. Just gonna keep walking, see, because you can't till you do the walk. Uh, it just seems. Like it's big, but it's it's bigger than you think. Lee Green Wood. Electric Lady Studios. Duke Duke and the Drivers. Duke and the Drivers. Okay. Duke and the Drivers. Another Boston band. Here's Howard Roberts. This would be good. Produced by Ed Rochelle, who we know. We know all these names here. Mike Kerr, My Little Fun House. Do we know who that is? I should know that, if it, but I don't. Roger Williams. Okay. Quarter Flesh. It's just... It's unbelievable. So now we've walked all the way back out to the machine that does all of the... There it is. Well, how, come, how come we're not working on this machine now? How come people are busy doing this 24-7? Because I'm here, I'm, I'm interrupting your... Sorry. I'm not sorry, actually. <laughs> I'm really not sorry. Okay, so we're, we're waiting for the people to come back. So here's Richard Thompson, Chad Blake, uh, Mitchell Foon, Dolby SR, and it's uh, Push and Shove, Electric Bass and Full Kit, and then Track 4 is the Master, beep, beep, beep. So you see a lot of these things are, uh, these, uh, these are analog recordings, but they only exist as single tracks because they didn't do vinyl of it, so they had the single analog track, and then it was assembled digitally for the release as a CD. So if you wanted to do this Richard Thompson album on vinyl, you would have to assemble all of these tracks. They have to find all these reels, which are obviously all over the place. They have to find all the reels of all the individual tracks and assemble them in the analog domain to cut a lacquer. That's what they would have to do. Conway Recording Studio, Poison. Red Hot Chili Peppers, here's 1989. Produced by Michael Beinhorn and the engineer was Steve Hallward and Garth Richardson. Just, this is the Aerosmith Geffen project. So they have all these Aerosmith Geffen tapes here. And they are going to put it through the this Amex machine. So they have it all cataloged. So that's what all of these. It's like virtually. You know, it's really funny. So it's it's Aerosmith from Boston. It's Jay Giles band from and I found Duke and the Drivers, which is I'm not, I didn't even know that Duke and the Drivers had an album out. I, I don't know what that was either. I know the band because yeah. they were in Boston when I was there, but I didn't know. <laughs> and I just happened to find that. Amazing. So they asked me what I would want to do down in these vaults, and I said, let's make believe I'm doing a reissue. And they chose the titles, and, uh, and so I, can, I have to go through this without you being able to hear what they're saying because there's proprietary things involved. Anyway, so someone calls up this person or someone in the vault there and orders the two titles that I'm going to be reissuing on my own record label, and then she will 
do whatever proprietary stuff has to be done through uh, Iron Mountain and Universal Music Group. And then she will go and fetch the tapes. So that's what they're talking about right now. And you can't hear the process because it's proprietary. Now, uh, she's going to where they exist, and she's uh, retrieving them. Uh, she knows exactly where they are because everything is, is cataloged in, in the system. And she's getting them out, and she's got a bunch of different things there. And then, of course, like you do at home, you very carefully don't uh, move anything around that doesn't have to get moved around. And then uh, put, she puts back what was there before, and then she brings the tapes to uh, a box, puts it in a box, and once it's all been registered, so it's all in their system, which we're not going to show you the details of because that's proprietary. She's typing something. You don't have to see what's being typed. I think it's okay for you to see that without any uh, explanation. And then she... Now, this is, this is all standard record keeping. So they know that they have a record of the fact that the tape's been pulled and it's going someplace and it goes in their system so that if it doesn't come back <laughs> after a certain period of time, uh, whoever has it gets called. Then uh, someone takes it. This is Evan Saunders, an, an IMS uh, employee. And he's bringing it, he's going to bring it uh, onto uh, one of these golf cart things there and drive it over, I had to stop shooting here, I can't show you this stuff. And uh, we're back where we started, and uh, now the tapes are at the incoming side here. And now this would go out to to me or, to, or sent? This is going to them to be digitized. Now, if it's sent out, we do a whole shipping. That's another process we do, right. and we send that one out. Okay. And if this is going to be digitized for, I'm doing a digital re reissue of this, it would, it would go into this room here. This, this room? Yeah, more than likely that would work. Yeah. And it looks like there's, some of it's a digital asset, and some of it's tape. So the tape ones would go in here and be put up on a two-track, um, let's see what they got here. And this is from Criteria. It was recorded at Criteria Recording Studio in Florida. The famous Criteria where, where Derek and the Dominoes was recorded and the Allman Brothers and much great stuff. And there's more reels because it's, the, it's real number three. Yes, end of secret. It's only the end of Secret Home and Wild Applause and Freebird. Okay, Freebird is on. That's all you need to know is Freebird's on there. What more, there what more do you I'm need? Nothing else. And it's the end of Sweet Home of course, there's wild applause when there's Freebird involved in it. Let's just, let's assume that that I asked for a high resolution digital file. You would put it up the two track tape on a two track machine. Right. Sorry. Um, well, if you wanted a high resolution digital file, which is what we what we pretty much do all the time, um, let's say you wanted uh, this tape here. Yeah. So we've got. It's got Skinner's. Freebird on. Freebird, it's, yeah. I just want to put out Freebird as a 12-inch single. A 12-inch single? Yeah. So you're going to take this multi-track and you're going to remix it? Gonna mix it so, yeah, I have to All do right. that. Sounds good. Yeah, so, I'd, have to, I'd do it or you would do it. Uh, I would, well, I'd, we would transfer it. Yeah. And then whoever is going to mix it, typically the label handles yeah. that. So you, 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 would tra you could make an analog copy if I wanted a uh, one-off the analog tape? You could do an analog. Because I'm wonderful. analog purist. So you would make a one-off the analog tape carefully done. Very carefully, yeah. And I would take that tape that eight track tape and I would have my guy mix it right. to From two track screen. analog and then we would cut the 12 inch single yep. and s sell it. Okay. You have analog all the way through. Uh, I'll take a look at it and judging on tape stocks, this is most likely Ampex 456. 456. So as many know, this is going to need to dehydrate before I play it. You gotta bake I it. Might damage it. So you I am gonna dehydrate this. Um, we do that for uh, eight hours at 130 degrees Fahrenheit in our convection oven. Where do I sleep while you're doing that? Oh, anywhere. We've got a couch somewhere. I'm okay, sure good. <laughs> so that's the that's the dehydrator. That is the dehydrator. So which is not the same as an oven. It's right. It different. has right, and it can it can operate at a lower temperature. Can you do vegetables in there while the tape is happening? <laughs> well, if you'd like the tape to have a nice scent, absolutely. Okay, good. Good. Too, then you can eat eat while you're doing absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. All right. So then you bake it. Right. Then you so we bake it. Put it in. Eight hours generally, you know. 
It's KitchenAid, too. That's interesting. Yes, yes. Oh, 16. So before I bring it over to this 27 here, I actually have to convert it over to a 16 track. Did you change the headstock? Yes, sir. I know this terminology. I've been around the block, <laughs> my friend. I know headstock and woodstock. I was at Woodstock. I never did go to Headstock. Was, is that, that was like a, a big festival for people who do tape recording Headstock? Headstock, no. yep. Okay. <laughs> this is a Studer. Yes, this is an 824 gold edition. I believe this is one of the final. One of Look the final. at that Headstock. Ooh -wee. Off with the head. Off with the head. Um, yeah, the next step would be I would uh, Spool the tape on. It's they're normally tails out, so right. I will archival wind it back right. onto it slowly, real slowly, slowly, right, and make sure that I'm here monitoring it. Make sure that if anything sounds strange or anything slows down or drags, right. or if there's any right. anomalies, right. we stop the process. So the the tapes just keep coming. Here's the Jay Giles band at the Boston Garden. This is, this is a. Uh, multi-trick tape and then below that is there is the Asia multi-track one of two one of two tapes ah, you see it was right below it jellyfish we were talking about the music oh yeah that's right spilled milk yeah the jellyfish the jellyfish was, was there she was playing that back and, and doing something with it in the other room checking it out now over there is a, it is a is a Asia Master? Yeah, on your, the multi drag Master. But to the right of your hand. Oh. And, uh, and what is that? I don't know. It's a Steely Dan Master. Which which one is it? Let's take a look. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's have Just a look. Bust oh. Loop Master. Section pieces for loop. Original with the... Fezon. With the Fezon track from... Which the A real master was made. So, I'm not even. I don't understand. Was there an assembled? But they this must have. I mean, maybe they made. A, a, there must be a loop on that song. I don't know. And this is and this is a master uh, multi-track. Yeah. Two inch. Okay, so that would have to be used. That was used to make a mix. Yeah. Right. Oh. So this has. Maybe. This has a false start. Take one. Right. Incomplete, incomplete. Digital metronome. Bass. Electric guitar direct. Mic, electric guitar mic. And a click. And track. a click. That's it. That's tracks nine. To, now you got tracks one. <laughs> That's where the so action now is. Royal scam. We've got API direct and hose. These are acronyms for other things or something. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a host, an ARP. Okay, ARP, that makes sense. Yeah. Bass, electric guitar, amp, direct, direct, click. It's interesting, um, you know, where are the drums? And this is, oh, Beatnik Beach, now called Jack Jellyfish. Oh, that was, that was a working artist name. Oh, oh, that's really cool. Be uh, Beach, B-E-A-T-C-H. I guess Beatnik, like that's supposed to be bitch or something that you can say. Yeah, it. I guess Biatch. That's the yeah. first album. Was this Baby's Coming Back? Oh, yeah. This is the first album. Yeah. Yeah, Belly Button. That was the, yeah, that was the name that's of the, the record. Of the album yeah. they were doing for it. But and what are these other tapes? Split I, Milk? Split Milk. That's the album I love. Oh, okay. That's, that was our second yeah, one. Yeah. I would love that to be at most bad if we uh, Why doesn't somebody re reissue these on vinyl? The tapes are all here. That's why That's why we pulled them. Oh. I literally asked them the other day, and here oh. they are, because somebody requested them from me. It's funny, you know, that's what's funny all that all the time. Do you know who's doing Henry it? Lewis. Oh, I don't know what they're doing with it. it. That's their first That's awesome, though. Yeah, he's, uh, we did sports, and we did uh, four. And with coffee. <laughs> and, and what is the Philadelphia... What is, this is all B-roll great Frank stuff, though. Yeah. This is... Yeah. Peter Frampton, which... 1971? Oh, yeah. No, 5. 75. Spectre, Spectre, oh, it's a live Spectre. Spectre. Oh, so it's probably stuff live. that used yeah. for comes alive. Could, so it, interesting, it's based like on one. Right? Usually you put the kick drum on the first track. Kick, snare, left drums, right drums. Rhythm guitar, talk box. Organ, piano, lead guitar, guitar, Leslie, Peter Vocal. Piano, direct, no good. No good. Uh, Andy, vocal, keys, vocal, Leslie. Audience, audience. There you go. Wow, that's cool. It's 16 tracks. 
Yeah, I, uh, Frampton Comes Alive came out in 76? I think so, yeah. So this would have been the same could, tour. I mean, they, they recorded so many different... Yeah, yeah, but it would have been the same tour, though. So yeah. I was on the radio talking about Peter Frampton in, in 72, saying he's going to be a big star one of these days. You know, He's, he's been around, he's been... You know, he's going to be... And he was in town, and he came on my radio show. Really? And that was Great. cool. Yeah, I, when I interviewed him two couple of weeks ago, we talked about that. It was it was oh, it was a so fun cool. interview. Yeah, it was really good. Who is this? this is this is like incoming outgoing. Is that what this, this is? This is a lot of the stuff I've just. Re- they they come to me uh, from the labels whenever they'll come and email me a request, like for whatever reason, whether it's a reissue, which is what I think the jellyfish is. I think they're going to put them on vinyl. Yep. Um, Huey, they're doing vinyl on that. I do know that, but that's why they came in. And then, so ironically, this is only this past week, and they're <laughs> these are all new. But the Steely request. Steely Dan Masters here. I mean, that's they were doing vinyl. There's somebody's doing a vinyl piece on that as well. Well, I know there's vinyl coming up, but yeah. but this would be multi tracks. Would have to be re- remixed or something. Wow. Sometimes they don't see all the details. It just kind of comes in because it could be for Atmos, it could be for yep. just different types of preparation. Louis Prima, Paramount. Look, I just want to look through every tape. I'm going to look through every tape. I do. What's this? Louis and Keeley. Oh, I've got this on. This should be come out again. It's a stereo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This should come out. These are great. In the studio where that console is. Can't even see what this is. Dot records. Mono is all, all more of Louis Prima. Someone's doing a Louis Prima box from the Paramount stuff. I look at their discography of this company. Oh, this is so great. There's going to be a big Louis Prima thing going on, obviously. Las Vegas Nights, Louis Prima. Yep, someone's doing a compilation. Louis yep. I love Louis Prima. That's so cool. But that's the cool part. So my team, so my team get we get the request, and I filter it out to my team. And my team actually starts doing all the digging uh, through our system, yeah. systems, yeah. and then they will request everything through here. Once they've determined it, these guys are spot check. Sometimes we're missing things, and they'll they'll let us know if we miss something or hey, this may be a better option. And then they go back into the files, and then that's how it all comes together. It gets digitized yeah. here, where you're going to see next. Yeah. So you got the right headstock back on there now, because we had the wrong headstock on there before. Correct. I don't want to mess up your thing, you know. Oh, no, all good. we got a 16-track headstock now. And which tape is this? This is the Leonard Skinner. This is oh. a Fox Theater Live, um, 1976, I believe. And this tape has been properly baked? It has been dehydrated. Are you baked? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not. Oh, too bad. I'm not able to say it. Yeah, yeah, no comment. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know what you know about tape machines, but the Studer Transport is known for its gentle tape yeah, handling. Like so butter. Really, like butter. Yeah. So when you do a transfer of this, you're, you're doing a flat transfer, not it just yeah. and levels are equal, you equalize all the levels. To a reference tone or a reference tape, um, and it's just all flat. So we're not introducing anything out of the ordinary or right. anything into the sound. And what are your A to D converters? What do you, what do you use? Uh, in this room, we're still using analog. Um, we're going to update this to the new prism shortly. And what are you using that? What is this? The analog, I think it's a 32. Oh, yeah. yeah. USB, USB 2.0. Oh, right. All right. In here. But we're basically using the shop. We do prisms mostly. Yeah. Um, we're using ADAs on all the other labels. Yeah. And you audition d- different A to D converters to see which sounds um, best. We, uh, we auditioned quite a few of them. Yeah. Um, we landed on the ADAs, yeah. the prisms, uh, several years ago. They seem to be uh, the most transparent. That's uh, what you're looking for, a transparency. That's you know, yeah, we were looking for something that wasn't color, you know, adding yeah. colorization or anything. You know, I personally think the burls are really cool, but not for digitizing, yeah. you know, priceless assets. And that's done on the basis of merit, not in term, you're not doing any kind of like deals, you know, like... Oh, oh you mean like handshakes? Yeah. No, no, no there's no <laughs> handshake. I wish they were <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or endorsement deals. No, 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 there's no so it's handshakes. Legit, it's a legit, right. you, you, so, yeah, it's legit, a merit-based system. Yeah, yeah we, we, we landed on prisms yeah. and decided that we wanted prisms. Yeah. And so it's been... Uh, well, it, it's it's pretty expensive to to get into that, you know. There's some money here. 
So and it's important, you know. Right. So you know, we have been putting together the rigs with prisms. So everything in this room next door is all prism. Yeah. All three rigs. Yeah, and then um, Nashville, Munaki, and Hollywood Studios. Are they're all prisms. Well, well and, with and, rare exceptions, they have a couple of the right. H, Pro Tools HD. And on top of it all, I have already ordered the prisms. So this is going to be a prism rig in a month. And are you the person in charge of making these decisions? Well, I'm one of the people. You know, um, I, I make lots of recommendations. Yeah. Um, there's some other, I, I, I've got some tech wizards here on our team as well. You know, and it, it's a mistake to not listen to the tech wizards. <laughs> you know, because they often ha have a, a view on something. As long as they listen as well, as long as they listen as well as look at measurements. Oh, right. you know? I was saying to Bob, this was such revolutionary technology back in the day. It's the Mitsubishi. Like, yeah. yeah, this, this looks, actually looks good, like a museum piece. Yeah, but this was a good sounding machine, actually. We do have an like. NX82 track operating as well. And the MX86. Wow, it does look like an, it looks like an ancient. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, got this, it's like Home Depot. <laughs> <right? There we laughs> <go>. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real thing. Is, is this working? It is working. Who uses the that. password? <laughs> um, was anything here that you have in your archives? You done on the 3M machine? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't know how much. In the Warner days, I know we had uh, we had a bunch because Amigo had a, had one. Yeah. Of those Is there machines. a working 3M machine in existence now? D uh, Disney has a couple. Do you guys have one? We have a yes. yeah, 32 track. Yeah. There you go. Wow. These guys have everything. Hmm. Super four as well. Yeah. It's the uh, Sony uh, Dash system 3348. Oh yeah. Feature. And anything you might need that you don't have, you can always procure someplace, I'm sure. Usually, yeah, we have some connections that we can get what we need and parts and things like that. We get creative, too. Do you have their name for this? Well, one? we just call them Studio 1 and 2. And which, this is 1? This would be Studio 1, okay. right? And so, over here, you know, the conversion on this rig is all down here. I have it shut off here at the moment, but it's all Prism ADAs. We can do 32 channels. 32 channels of... Uh, Prism conversion here on this rig, Dolby uh, A and SR right. decode here. Um, this is all based uh, off the output of this Studer 827 here, which is slightly older vintage than Matt's because it's not a gold edition. And how do they they sound similar? I think they sound pretty much identical. Yeah, I would hope that would be the case. You know, um, the other part, the other thing is, is a lot of the time. Um, uh, you should, what's your name? My name's Brett. Okay. Good. Um, a lot of the time, the, the head stacks are removable on these, yeah. so we can run 24 track on right. it, we can run 16, we can run 1 inch 8 track. Um, with a little bit of ingenuity, you can run uh, Scully 12 track on oh. it as well. Um, so so the, only, the only difference between these two machines um, is the, the way we synchronize it to time code. Yeah, I mean we have a microlink system on this to synchronize it to time code, and we have a uh, Adam Smith Zeta three on the other machine. Okay, uh, I have this. And this is your board. This is, this is searching for something here, I imagine. And clocking, uh, uh, Antelope ten M. Right. Uh, that's clocking a Antelope Trinity, and then we use the Trinity to distribute clock to everything in the room, so everything is. Clock to the nth degree. Um, you know, we're not really necessarily doing um, critical listening in the respect of for enjoyment. Right. Of course. You know, we're, we're you know we're listening more for like anomalies and you know phase shifts in the stereo field and that's drop important outs stuff. And things though. of that nature. Phase shifts. The, the the idea is for us to be able to send the best possible transfer to whatever the next part of the chain is. Right. Whether it's a mastering engineer or whether they're, you know, uh, whether it's a final production piece that's going to, like, say, a streaming service or something right. of that right. nature. So that's the goal here. Um, so, and, of course, we occasionally do some mixing and stuff like that for some of our clients here. So I have a, you know, a control surface here that basically is just a control surface for Pro Tools. Right. And, uh, and your, your monitors are Ad Adam Audio? Yep, got Adams and NS10s on this rig here. If you must. Um, yeah, the NS10s, right, exactly, for references. Okay. Um, 
you know. So that's basically what we have going on on this one. But because this is a 32 channel rig and we have uh, everything Elko'd in, we can just pop an Elko and roll something else in. So if this, if this. So the reason the room is really versatile, you can, whatever. Yes. It has to be. You have it has to, be, able to, to be, be, because we never know what's coming through the door next. Yep. It might be a uh, one inch eight track today, it might be, um, you know, three track tomorrow, it might be four track the day after that. And what's the state of this ATR here? You have. I just don't stack. have a head stack on it. Um, the head stack's been taken off to be used somewhere else. But again, I can use. I can put a mono head stack on it. I can put a stereo head stack on it. Three track, four track, butterfly heads, that sort of thing. So it's very versatile. Um, again, one basically any format, one to four track, be it quarter inch or half inch yep. on this machine. And uh, you know we can do all the speeds. We uh, can do, uh, well, we don't do one seven eights on these. We use other machines for the yeah, one seven eights stuff. That would be a okay. that would be a cassette master. Well, well, now one seven eights is, would be more like a dictation format, yeah. like somebody yeah. who's like recorded a boardroom meeting or something like yeah. that. It's not so much audio critical, yeah. um, but when you're getting into the audio critical stuff, it's you know we can do three and seven eights up to thirty amps right. on these machines, um, and again this machine is hooked up to this station here where there's another prism in play. Um, also have a Dolby in it. In the case of uh, every now and then, somebody requests DSD. Yep. I had the Tascam DA-1000. Where but I you don't do DXD, right? I do not do DXD. I don't have <laughs> Not DXD. much of that around. Um, I, I've never had a call for it in 20 years. Nobody's yeah. ever asked for it. Yep. Um, well, it's a new, kind of a new, you know, the 32-bit Third, what is it, 32 bit, three, 384, 32 bit right, DCM? Right. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's extremely high. You know, but I mean, I can do 2.8 and 5.6 DSD yeah. on, on the task cam. Only two channel. Granted, I've not had a single request for anything more than that either. Um, but we can do the DSD transfers here too. Yep. And if, if there's not Dolby on the tape, it's literally. There's nothing between the recorder and the tape machine. I literally will uh, interconnect the tape machine directly into the Tascam. Yep. And then I will monitor out of the Tascam through the prism, which is an interesting thing in itself because we, we normally digitize at 192.24 here. And uh, when you're running DSD and you monitor at 192.24, you can see the noise shaping. Oh. Because it's because 192 is up that high, right. so you can't you can't really monitor off of the Tascam yeah. higher than 96 because right. you see the noise. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, an interesting little quirk. The very first time that I did that, I was like, I don't understand entirely what's happening here. And then as I you know read a little bit more about. Uh, how the DSD actually worked with the noise shaping. I was like, oh, that's noise shaping we're, we're seeing there because it's the frequencies are that high, you just yeah. can't hear them. Right. You know, you can't, I I don't even have, yeah, yep. I don't even I don't even have a uh, I don't even have a you, you don't have bad ears. Well, I don't even have a a, a spectrum analyzer that goes that high. Oh. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the noise shaping's at so. All right, I think we have a good handle on Same this room. Same thing going on here. That basically, Carrie's rig here is basically a mirror of this rig that you were just looking at. So that's the guy. So this is like the same as you'd have in a recording studio in terms of the hierarchy of the engineering staff and the studio manager has to watch incoming, outgoing content, uh, production, Quality and production, uh, how much you can get accomplished in a given period of time. Is, is there an, is there an amount of work that you have to get done? And is it like a is there a schedule? Like I must put a, oh, a inspect X number of tapes. And, oh, uh, uh, like uh, I'm, I'm I'm screwing everything uh, up today, actually, quite obviously. <laughs> this is this is the guy that you need to talk to about that uh, because so, we're you know uh, with the work that we do for them, it's a lot of it's on demand for them. So, right. they so there's a combination of on demand and there's also just the normal rote. Archiving, so there's two separate two separate things going on at one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know we have our you know different initiatives for uh, yeah. uh, things like at risk formats or like you know formats that have become obsolete that we're always right. trying to uh, you know 
take care of and get off into better formats and right. yeah I mean but the you know the commercial aspect of you know that uh, probably drives a good amount of it I would say right yeah, and, yeah. yeah. we call it the speed of entertainment here <laughs> is, I, I, is, I like that is, is you know because when you guys need it you guys need it because you've got some plan for people it. have schedules yeah, right, right. You, yeah That's people right. have schedules like you, you've, you've scheduled a mastering engineer or you've scheduled a lathe cut or right. you've, you've got a, a a schedule for getting something pressed or something like well, that. And Christmas yeah. comes at a completely different time every single right. year, right? So when you do send out tapes, because you're still willing to do that, how does it get sent out? Federal Express? or? Um, so it, it, the answer is it depends. So nothing leaves uh, the mountain here until it's been preserved. Yeah, I was so going to say, they all come here before they, they go anywhere. First. Right. So if we can help it, nothing ever leaves. Right, um, but people still want to cut from analog In tape. those cases, yeah. So they'll come here, get transferred first, and then... Uh, you know, if it's a one-off thing, you know, like usual ship, like maybe like a UPS uh, sort of thing, it's always overnight. Um, yeah. You know, make sure it's scary. It's still scary. Setting. Never on a weekend. Is, yeah, never on a weekend. Right. <laughs> you don't want to be sitting in a... It's still, it's still a scary thing. And, oh, and there's a huge insurance cost, I'm sure. If somebody wants to do that, they have to pay a lot of money in insurance yeah, to and you. Yeah, we, we, and we insure, we insure the shipments. Yeah, um, you know, of course. So, uh, and then, um, you know, if it's larger quantities of assets that are moving, we'll actually do like more like white glove. Yeah. delivery service stuff and you know right. Iron Mountain does a quite a bit of that work as well so you know, someone will drive it someplace yeah like you go to Nashville or you'll go yep yeah. I was going to say that has happened yes. no, I know I know, <laughs> I know the beacon, beacon storage for Blue Note those things get hand brought and it's very carefully controlled which it has to be these days right I, yeah, right exactly I mean the, the assets are in value by yeah of course and you remember uh, my colleague Eric Bricker I think that you met up in uh, Portland Yes. And, uh, yeah, so that was a, it's another situation where, you know, we worked with Iron Mountain, and they drove those things back into two And where are the, those tapes came here that were, that were uh, important? No, those are in Hollywood. They got to Hollywood. Those got to Hollywood, and they did that in a two-driver team. They didn't. They basically didn't stop. And it, has anything happened with those tapes? Have they been played and auditioned? And, and um, they've been cataloged at this point. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure. I couldn't say offhand how many have been digitized. Yeah. Well, I hope that turned out to be useful things for you. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, good. Great. That, that was my okay, intervention. Important. Could I, uh, Am I allowed to know? Uh, <laughs> GRT. Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, thank, thank you guys. Thank yeah. you guys. We're going to do a little driving tour. Okay. Our video Hi, Dan. Nice to meet you. Um, one of a team, um, but this is our video room. So same, same sort of deal. We're running a wall of all of the most common formats, and then we have uh, like more obscure formats in the back wall, depending on what comes in. Right. All this hubs to this capture station. And then we run video preservation for UMG and a whole slew of other customers. So, wow. Um, I built a Heathkit color TV in 1969, all, all vacuum tubes and uh, all point to point hand wiring. Took a whole summer to build it, and all, all the pots were motorized, and uh, it came with all the, all the color stuff in it and convergence so you could I had this TV looking like as good as a monitor would look in a studio and a week after it was finished my house got robbed and it got stolen that's when I learned the art of letting go yeah so that's uh so, so you do can you what happens to the umatic tape when the tape's in bad shape you can't bake that tape can you yeah you dehydrate it yeah we so do. you do the same thing yeah usually about 120 130 degrees low and slow and uh they used to come out pretty well. It's surprising how well some of these being vaulted down here or the shape that they're in. I'm running some now that was from 89. Yeah. And they run great. They run great. So I've got a bunch of umatic tapes from projects I've done years ago. If I had trouble, could I hire you to... to Absolutely. Work? Okay, well, I'll consider that. Yeah, very seriously. We, we have, it's, we're not locked to just our customers here at the Underground. Of course, that is a huge advantage, but yeah. if archives come in and they want to hang on to their stuff but utilize our services, so we've put together the, the expertise, the archival engineers, plus the collection of equipment, which yeah. that's the big challenge sure. right now is getting, maintaining, and, uh, and operating this stuff. Some of, these, some of the uh, institutional knowledge of how to run this stuff is, uh, is gone, except with some of our older friends. Yeah. You got a nice beta machine there, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've got, I've got a nice beta machine. Like, yeah. it took us a while to figure out how to get that 12 o'clock to blink. <laughs> yeah. okay. So this is our imaging department. Some of them, we actually have three different spaces that we've kind of spilled out over into over the last couple of years. Basically, AJ uh, here is our supervisor. We also have a project manager that handles things, but I'm also the solutions, uh, solutions architect for different projects that come in and just but across the globe now at this point, so that's exciting. Um, so one of the things I'm going to show you is uh, one of the solutions we came up with for the art flat uh, request. Um, so, but a lot of the other things that we do here are any kind of imaging work, so any kind of transmissive or reflective work for posters, um, anything you can see through. Some of the examples on the wall we can actually talk about. Um, so we digitize, we, sorry, we um, triage, um, meta capture metadata and handle those materials um, and then we capture in our capture room which I'll show you and then do post-production and then a QC portion. Okay, I'm familiar with the word triage but not in relation to this so what, what, what does it mean in relation to this? So triage we look to make sure there's no damage like vinegar syndrome oh, I see. or um, there's also some materials from the 70s that are actually leaching plastics onto some of the um, some of some of the images that we've seen by other clients so we make recommendations based upon the collection of like how it's stored how it's organized and do you find it it's almost the problems are related to by decade in a certain decade there are certain no. problems no no because it could be a photographer who um, extended their fixer a little bit too long oh, and didn't clean out their fixer or or their develop or, or their stop bath so if any of those chemicals either weren't mixed properly or they tried to make them last too long, that will also damage assets. Um, if anything got wet, if anything was too dry. <laughs> so it's it's very fickle media, just like most other yeah. things. So okay. it doesn't really matter what decade. Okay. It could be any. I mean, the chemicals changed and the, and the process has changed and the, the products changed, right? Oh, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're looking from glass plate silver nitrate eggs to now everything's digital and, and on a CCD chip. So over the last. 150 years, it's been a very dramatic change. So one of the projects and one of the solutions that we came up with were um, our art flats, so large envelopes. Uh, we didn't know what was in those envelopes, and we were trying to figure out a really easy way to tell what we had. Um, if it was original artwork, it was just kind of sitting, not really being well taken care of. So one of the things we wanted to do was triage, collect metadata, rehouse it, and then also make it really easy for for everyone to see what was actually in. So, do you this have is an, actually, yeah, I'm sorry, do you have an art flat uh, in its original form or no? Of course. No, I know. I'm <laughs> not right here. I can dip. So, uh, Michael, so in the art flats, as I was describing earlier, with these big paper or paper stock, like hard paper, like cardboard yeah. envelopes. And so all the components were stored uh, vertically on, on, their, on their edges, which is sure. probably not a great way to long Because it kind of, it kind of store faded stuff. down and yeah. fell down. So, and that's per project? Yeah. There was a given album cover, let's say, would have right. all of the elements contained. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. the packaging art in, in In one envelope. Yeah. And any notes from the artist or whatever. Right. right. Here's an example of you know, one of the envelopes and what it looked like. So our goal was to capture everything. So we captured the front and the back of each envelope, just in case there was any handwriting or notes or anything like that. And then also anything inside. So this is just an example of what was inside. So we captured that. We also included numbers above each asset so that if we ever wanted to do at an asset level, we could go back later on. This is this the same machine that you had to do the tape boxes? This yeah. is a different solution. Different machine. Okay. Yeah. So if you just want to smidge back just a second. Of course. <laughs> So oh. here's the final product. So this would have all been stored in a big white sort of paper right. envelope. So this is an example of, of what you're seeing here. So we also, um, here's an example of this, so this is another But they example. wouldn't have been individually put it, wrapped in this right, beautiful stuck paper. Right, just, just stuck in an envelope, right? Yeah, right. And the, Bethany, each of these wrapped pieces is a separate art flat. Correct, correct. correct. So, so we can, um, understand what was in each one of these um, through the photos that were captured. But they're also, they also live in here. Yep. 
And, we also, and you're not going to take that apart for me. You're just going to show me the nope. pictures. That's good. No, no I'm not going to take it. <laughs> no, good. I, I would say <laughs> That's please. the point of the photo. Please don't. Sure. Right. Um, so then we've also we've also created a, a um, dedicated filemaker database to capture all of the metadata, so including um, size, how many assets are in each one. Um, also, then you can you know double check the images. So we did a, a physical QC and a digital QC as well. And what um, is this exactly? This is a FileMaker database. No, I mean what this oh, what's what this, this project? Oh, I, I don't. Um, you know what? What I is that? Even. <laughs> not big enough. Hold on. Um, this is a cover of a. Is it a DVD or? It looks like a um, a VHS. Oh, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Something. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Well, there's no Photoshop on this, so I don't know if we can even blow it up anymore. But, yeah. Okay. So it's for a VHS cover. All right. So, yeah, those are the color blocks. Put all that in there is for one VHS cover. Correct. Everything in that's in there. Fantastic. Correct. So all of all that, that is just for that one, that one cover. Correct. So it's just this. Just this. These are other other assets. Right. Yeah. Oh. Maximize the, the capacity of the box with yes. multiple oh. projects. But it keeps it separate as well. Uh, so, there, so there are multiple projects in this box. Correct. Oh, they're all organized. organized by... We have Slayer at Wembley. Oh, okay. Doesn't everybody? Yeah. Blood Red Pony. Yeah, so Summit. And how do you determine what gets shared in the box? In a box. It doesn't matter. Doesn't doesn't because you know where everything is. We know where everything right. is. Okay. Good. They don't have to be like items necessarily. Right. Obviously, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Slayer whatever, and the whatever's fabulous, finishes. whatever. Yeah, d definitely not the same thing. And one of the cool things about this uh, this new method of of, this, of us packing them this way for us is, uh, you know, Bethany's seen this like this one here may have been in like a giant envelope that took up a bunch of space, but really it was only this much material, right? Right. So, you know, we're actually able to reduce the storage. And they can mix and match a bunch of different things. Now, how do you store these? Vertically? Do you store horizontally? Horizontally. Yes, horizontally, yes. And, and the top of the box is strong enough to, you can right. stack yes. these? Yeah, yeah. So we've got it um, We've got it rated for how much weight the box can uh, withhold. Okay. And then, you know, we've, we've measured and that And these out. boxes have to be custom made for your needs? or? So, no, these are actually boxes, archivally, are archivally created boxes from Gaylord which is an archival preservation company. Oh. So yeah, we ordered them special for this particular project. And you, free and paper, yes. acid free boxes. Right, so you've got a, you've got a storage barcode. facility here on the, on the premises here where all of these things are stored, stacked and cataloged. And so at the push of a button, you could bring one of these out to get something out of it yeah, if you absolutely. need it to have. But if you needed Slayer at Wembley, you could find it in the database. And then somebody would bring the whole box, presumably, Correct. Right, and yeah. pull it out. Yeah. Right. One of the goals is we didn't want people leafing through things. We yeah. wanted to be able to just bring us this box. We can find this. We don't have to, you know, leaf through everything yeah, in the box. Of course. We know exactly where it is in the box as well. So we actually also created QR codes to make it really easy, easy to access this. Well. Right. And who, who came up with all of this? Who, 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 who devised um, all of this? Our, our team here. A team. Our, um, it's yes, teamwork. Team we don't give any individual credit for anything. It's a team. Team Absolutely, effort. Absolutely. Which sir. is good for everybody to be involved. It wasn't just me. No, I know. There was a large group of people that helped us come okay. up with well, this. When they all leave, you can tell me it was really you. So. <laughs> no, that's not my. That's not. That's not. Me. Okay. So, so, unfortunately, we're working, on a, we're working with a client right now that's top secret. So we can't oh. really show you any of the assets that we're capturing. Okay. Right now, but I can show off our equipment. I love the room, though. This yeah, room. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So our team is um, a certified team. All of the all of the people that work on this side are all certified uh, with these particular. What does that mean? They're, in, they're insane. Certified insane. Or <laughs> what? Well, I mean, after working underground for so long, you know, you never. Know. Who, who certifies them? <laughs> so we actually take classes uh, with Capture One. Which is and and also DT Cultural Heritage, who's actually um, helped uh, helped us with the machines. I see. So these are cultural heritage, FAGI compliant. Library Congress uses them as well, but we actually have one of the highest con uh, uh, concentrations of, of machines. So we've got five machines in here. We've got three atoms and two elements. But eventually, when we move into our new space, each one of these machines will have their own private space. So once everything is captured in a raw format here, we actually go over to the post-production room. So if you want to go ahead and back out, sure. I'll show you that. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's look at the dogs. That's why it's important in my life to look at the dogs. Oh, Corgi. 
Oh. It's a Pembroke. Pembroke. That's the Pembroke Welsh oh. Corgi. That's the Queen's Dog, which is not the same as the Cardigan Welsh Corgi, which is a totally different breed. black and white points. Um, it's also another QC point check for us as well. So again, using capture one. And again, most of the team, um, I, think it, I think everybody in here at this point has been certified. I just got mine. Yeah, there you go. Good job. It's on the fridge. <laughs> so again, um, we really want to keep the clicks, or not the clicks, but like the pressure off the machines and just really want to kind of create like more of a one, step one, step two, step three. Um, and again, it creates a QC check at each point as well. So once everything is captured here, it goes back out to our um, asset management team um, at basically FileMaker database. So we QC to make sure that everything's been captured, um, that we've that we're that we're good to go and then we outbound those those assets. Alright, thank you, thank you so much. Alright, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.